Good evening, everyone. I see that our, our communities are beginning to join us tonight. Hello, hello, welcome. It is seven o'clock, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with the conversation. Um, my name is Felicia Zamora, and I am um, a poet and assistant professor here at the University of Cincinnati. And I will be the host and leading us through this conversation tonight. We have a very special guest that I'm going to be introducing you all to here in just a moment. But first again, welcome. This is a new conversation series through the Department of English at the University of Cincinnati entitled Poetry as Radicalization and Liberation for BIPOC and Marginalized People. Again, I am the host. And this series sort of came about through my own research and interests in a search for a collective exploration of poetry's role in activism and social change, specifically from contemporary poets that I believe whose art is directly reflecting such inquiry. And this conversation has been made possible by support from the Charles Phelps Taft Center, the Arts and Sciences Faculty Development Award in the Vice Provost's Office, and the Latino Faculty Association at the University of Cincinnati. On behalf of the English department, we acknowledge the Cincinnati area and the land that the University of Cincinnati has been built on is the native homeland of the indigenous Algonquin speaking tribes, including the Delaware, Miami, and Shawnee tribes. Before we begin tonight's conversation, we are excited in the English department to host a lineup of authors for you this spring, including the 2022 Elliston poet and resident, Hyde E. Erdrich, author of Little Big Bully, winner of the National Poetry Series and published by Penguin in 2020. As, um, as well as poet and professor, Dr. Craig Santos Perez, who will be joining us in April for this conversation. So today we have guest poet and professor, Dr. Danica Kelly, who will be joining us. Before uh, I dive into the questions with uh, Dr. Kelly, with Danica, let me introduce you all a little bit to her work. How does one survive? Save the self, love the self, as an act of reclamation of history and the body. Danica Kelly writes in her poem, Dear, I know nothing of fire, its reach, its spread, know only that every body makes its own ash, manages its own diminishing. Oprah.com called the renunciations a lion-hearted odyssey through the self, a casting aside of old mythologies and traumas in search of new stories fashioned from love and joy. Like some sort of oracle, Kelly offers the words to create our own destinies. Danica Kelly is the author of The Renunciations, published by Grey Wolf Press in 2021, and Bestiary, also from Grey Wolf. Bestiary won the Cave Canem Poetry Prize, a Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry, the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, long listed for the National Book Award, and was a finalist for the Publishing Triangle Award and a Lambda Literary Award. A Cave Canem graduate fellow and member of the collective Poets at the End of the World, Kelly has also received a Lannan Residency Fellowship and a Summer Workshop Fellowship from the Fine Arts Work Center. Her poems have been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic Online, The Paris Review, and Foglifter. She currently lives in Iowa City and is an assistant professor of the University of Iowa, where she teaches creative writing. Please help me welcome Danica Kelly. Alicia, <laughs> that was a, that introduction was amazing. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I don't know if it does you justice, but it's amazing because it's about you. <laughs> oh, I got nervous. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you so much for sharing virtual space with me and our communities here in Cincinnati and beyond. Um, I think the way I want to start this conversation tonight is with a kind of a larger zoomed out question of where are you finding joy right now? 
Mm-hmm. Um, knowing that we've been in two years plus almost of this pandemic, mm-hmm. um, joy is so important to me and to the other artists I've been talking to as well. And I want to know where you're finding it and also where your art is right now as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been finding joy um, in the same places that I've always found it uh, in my community. Uh, so I I still feel like I'm in school, even though like now I'm teaching, but I, I have been in the university for like most of my life. And it's such a transitory space um, where people are always sort of moving in and out. And uh, so I have a lot of friends who are dear to me uh, and we no longer live in the same place. And that has been true with like different waves of friends. And so the, the strategies that we used to be in touch with each other before the pandemic still work. Uh, so I, I talk on the phone a lot to my friends. Uh, I have a few friends who really want to Zoom. Um, and I do that because I love them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my preference is the phone. I really like talking. I have a lot of talking needs. Um, I have uh, <laughs> friends who I mostly text Yeah. Uh, And that's like the way that we stay in touch is like a really robust sort of texting uh, uh, practice. Uh, And I've also found, I found a lot of joy in the classroom. Mm. Uh, Young people, I work uh, primarily with uh, undergrads and they're wonderful Uh, at every institution, at every institution I've taught at. They're just like, they're so fun and game and, um, I am often expressing my gratitude in class for the ways that they show up um, and talk about poems with me because it's just like such, it's like it ought not to be a privilege, but like in this iteration, this timeline, it it does feel like a privilege to to sit around a table, to be in a Zoom room, um, to just like talk with young people who are interested in poems, maybe don't know about poetry, um, who come at it with all of these like sort of different energies and ideas. And I think that's been um, like those two spaces have been um, talking with my friends, working with my students. Those have been like the, the sort of deepest pockets of joy. Um, I did get married. Uh, <laughs> you did. I did. I did. I, did. I got, we got married uh, in June of last year, Melissa Phoebos and I. So now we're wives, which is funny. Congratulations. Uh, you, know, you. you were in the participation <laughs> was in the fall and I didn't even, I didn't even know that. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I mean, I, she is the one, if you want to know about like the business, the sort of narrative business, she's the person to follow on the, um, <laughs> she really <laughs> likes to make like elaborate posts on Instagram and uh, Twitter. So, um, but it is, it's like, that's been, it's just like she and I have been together for five years now. And that relationship is also just like one of the most nurturing relationships I've ever had in my life. Uh, so I, I feel really fortunate uh, that in, during this time mm. that I've been able to connect with like my sort of historical communities, my long lived communities, um, get to sort of be loved in this particular relationship with Phoebos uh, mm. and talking <laughs> with students. Um, and all of that's feeding um, as I love it too, is, is feeding the art. Yes. Um, yes, yes, yes. So that was your second question. Where is my art right now? Um, it's the, I was like, we're in the thick of the semester. So there isn't much art. I'm not making a lot of art right now. But, <laughs> but you're, but you're uh, thinking, the thinking is part of the art making. I, I always yeah. try to notice that. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like anxiety about it uh, because I know when I have time and when my brain can relax, which is not right now. This is not like a relaxed brain time. <laughs> um, but when, when uh, you know, like the, I, I typically write on the breaks more often these days. And I, I write a little bit more in the fall. The spring is always too busy for writing. Um, but uh, how do I say this? Uh, so yeah, so I'm writing poems, uh, lots of love poems, because that's mm. always fun. Um, I've been thinking a lot about my mom and my grandma, who was a terrifying lady. Uh, I've been thinking about whales. Um, I went to Honolulu 
Well, like the, uh, and, like the, the mammal whale. Yeah. Like the, like the, like the enormous mammal that lives yes. in the sea. <laughs> um, and like, I've been thinking, so I've been thinking like mostly about humpbacks cause I find them interesting. Mm-hmm. Like that is increased, like that is the, the, the species of whale that I'm finding most interesting. And then there are also orcas. I'm also interested mm-hmm. in orcas. So, um, I was able to travel, um, to Hawaii in January. Um, and I got to do some, it was not the trip that I had imagined for lots of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, it was, it was a much more solitary experience, which I think was correct. Mm-hmm. Um, but I just, you know, I stood on the shore and I, on the, at the beach and I had my binoculars and I was just looking and that was fun to just like look and try to see something and try to think mm-hmm. about it and have a lot of feelings. So, uh, so the art is good. The art feels, uh, nurturing and nourishing as it, as it has for, I don't know, the last 20 years. It's one, it's like, it's a very sort of stable presence in my life. It doesn't feel in danger yeah. of like collapsing in any way. Yeah. Um, so. I mean, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, there's this, this like this deep inhale that I took where, where I wasn't writing and didn't have any intention of writing because I just needed to, to center my, me and my communities and, and, it felt like one of those moments of survival. Um, mm-hmm. And then it just came, it came back. You know, the art always taps me on the shoulder or actually it's more like, it's more like the thing scratching in my, in, in my chest of like, mm-hmm. time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you were whale watching or looking yes. because I, I'm a, sort of obsessed with whales. Um, I'm one of those people who like loves Moby Dick but it's because I didn't read Moby Dick until I was, <laughs> in my thirties and in that, you know, Moby Dick's not even about whales, but it kind of is about, mm-hmm. Whales. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whales are just this wonderful metaphor of social justice and in so many different ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I got me some whale poems that just came yeah. like flooding out recently. So I yeah, <laughs> I think they do that. I think they do that. I like thinking about them as just like having lives that are just so like that operate on a logic that is so much more brilliant than the logic of our lives. Like whatever, like in the West we've decided to do is nonsense. Yep. The whales are like, we like the humpbacks are like, we go to Alaska and we eat for six months and then we go to Hawaii and we have babies and we are warm and we are in the water for six months. And I'm like, that's genius. (laughs) I want to be like, that's genius level. And that is where I would like to get to in my life. Just like to be that kind of genius. Um, Oh, absolutely. And I don't think it can happen from like their behavior where for me thinking about the whale like we can only see the whale and the whale's body like in the water Mm -hmm. and what it does in the water is like tremendously complex and Mm -hmm. gorgeous and mysterious and then you take a whale out of water and it isn't it isn't even like a whale or it's Mm -hmm. it's not holding its whaleness because it's no longer in the environment it's meant to thrive Mm -hmm but yet it also whales or mammals. So they need air. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm just enthralled of their, um, their ability of adaptation and also like, um, con- concaving and convexing based mm-hmm. on the, where they are. Mm-hmm. So I could have a whole show on whales. But <laughs> that is not this show. So I, I digress. <laughs> we digress together. So. <laughs> I know it's like whales. Um, I do want you to talk a little bit about your thoughts and, and maybe I was already hinting toward it with my whales mm-hmm. equating to social justice. <laughs> but yeah. what do you think of when I say poetry is activism? You know, how do you see poetry in relation to social change? Um, is it activism? Is, is it not activism? And is it, is it only a tool to use toward activism? I've been, I've been thinking about that question a lot because I I feel like that's been in, that question's been in the ether for like, as far as I've been clocking it for a few years now. And when I sit down to write for myself, it's like, that doesn't necessarily, it doesn't feel like activism. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I'm sitting down to write, but I think there is something radical in holding the space to make slow art. Mm -hmm. Right. So I may not be out sort of affecting social change in that manner 
but I am like modeling for myself that I do not need to be always producing under capitalism in the way that capitalism would like me to always be producing and like laboring um, that like, I don't write poems for money, you know, like, it's just like, it's, it's a, it's outside of that system for me. Um, and when it enters into that system, it always feels a little funny. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I, I, the other thing that I think about is how um, poems and poets have changed my life and my thinking. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. And I think part of that has to do with just like the time spent quiet with a poem, but also mm-hmm. then like what the poem, the work that the poem is doing, not necessarily on the page. Like sometimes that's fun to sort of think about the form and like the sort of like mind blowing effects of that. Um, but I, those poems that are so open and vulnerable where the speaker is recounting or moving through an experience that is similar enough to an experience that I've had connects me to the world yeah. more, like I, fe- I don't feel alone. And I think that's the thing that poetry has done for me. It sort of like situates me in, um, maybe community is like even too small it's like just like in the history of being like this animal (laughs) I'm just like right 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 you know so it's so that isn't I don't think that's activism um but I do think that um poetry can affect social change Um, but I think it's slow and I think it happens more on the individual level um but I also think about but like to maybe move it out of the Uh, how to say this part there's the teaching (laughs) right so (laughs) so there's like how I'm changed and then I take that energy and joy and you know having been affected into the classroom so we read recently um Paisley Rechdahl's Nightingale um Mm. which is a really hard book um the the way that she is um, writing about like sexual assault in that book, um, the way that that speaker is moving through that experience. Um, like I, I brought it into class and I said to my students, I like model for them. I was like, the first time I tried to read this book, it was, I tried to read it. Yeah. I got to that middle section. I said, actually not today. And so, (laughs) um, and so with them, I was like, if that's where you are, that's okay. I was like, if you just get to that middle part and you're like, nope, not going to do it. I was like, that's totally fine. I was like, I think she is doing something. She's taking care of the reader. She's taking care of that speaker. There's a lot of infrastructure in that book. Um, (laughs) Like an infrastructure of care and ethics of care working in that book um, that comforts me, that makes me feel safe moving through it. Um, But the first time I encountered it, it was overwhelming for me. And so some of it's modeling for students like how to take care even in like a university space that says you have to be a good student. Yeah. I'm like, we're in a poetry class. So we're just gonna like take care of ourselves and we're gonna be slow or we can be slow and we're gonna move in the ways that feel safe. Um, but so I, I, I think maybe then that will ripple. I think those ripples are slower. Yeah, you yeah. Know? I mean, I think I, I, I get that. I get that the slowness, but there's like this, this intriguingness to the slowness of what our art can do once it has left us. Mm-hmm. Like when it's not ours anymore and it's part of this larger conversation that the idea that our art has the ability to change someone's thought processes mm-hmm. or to move them emotionally. Cause I'm right there with you. You know, I know a lot of um, form junkies out there who are like the form, like if the form <laughs> is doing something very radical that's mm-hmm. where it's all at. And, and I'm down with that. You know, I look at some forms and I'm like, damn I wish I, mm-hmm. I did that. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's the expression of, am I moved? Am I moved in a way that, that I have a reaction that feels genuine or vulnerable, or I can see the risk that this author and this voice is taking in the piece. Mm -hmm. And and I think that opens us up, you know, to being swayed 
and, and not just poets reading poetry, because I want to give a small shout out. I love that you always bring it back to education and to, to the classroom, too. I want to give a shout out to the students in my creative writing and social change who are in this class or who are in with us tonight. <laughs> Yay! I, I see you all. <laughs> and, and, you know, we have all these conversations about what, what does the art do versus what do we as human beings and artists need to be doing and how we can wield our talents and abilities and our inquiries and wonders in our art to, to add to something. I mean, this whole conversation series actually started because I was sitting in an AWP um, panel watching, um, it was Mar Martina Spada, but Joshua Bennett was on the panel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Joshua just said that the state of dis disinformation, he was thinking about, we're either trying to make the world a better place or we're doing something else. Mm -hmm. And that something else to this damn day haunts me. Mm -hmm. Like, am I trying to make the world a better place or am I doing something else? Mm. And I think asking that about our art is, is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, though, it's a slow process. It may or may not be activism. Like part of me wants to believe that the art itself becomes activism despite mm. our positionality as, as artists. Um, and I would say, you know, your book, Renunciations, um, there's a lot of care in here that you're you're giving us in this experience, this tough, tough experience, right? Mm -hmm. But you have cared as well. Like you're talking about Paisley's care in the mm -hmm. construction of, of the poetic worlds and, and the book as an overall. This there's a, so much care um, that I felt held at times mm -hmm. to enter into something that felt unbelievably um, vulnerable for not only you as authorial presence, but anyone who has had this type of trauma in their existence. Mm -hmm. And it's also a book that I find so reclaiming yeah. um, of that self-love making. And, and, and with that, I'm actually gonna do a very long introduction to this next question. <laughs> Wait, wait, wait. I do want to say, like, I'm so like, it makes me so grateful that you see that care in the work because it took me so long, like as a person yeah, to get to that, <laughs> like to be able to like care for myself and care for all those little, little parts, um, to care for, like to actually start to think about like what it would mean to, to be caring in the art. Like that took a long time. And yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that that came through. It does. And it, it does in a way that feels unbelievably um, attentive and generous, generous mm -hmm. to, I think, the self-making, which comes through to us as readers as um, we are being held in the process um, by the language used, by the imagination, by the mythology that comes in. Mm -hmm. So, so here's, here's my little ditty of what I wrote, but <laughs> so, <laughs> like in the renunciations, um, mm -hmm. you know, it weaves both ache and beauty, this rendering of past and present in constant fluidity, how a body never harbors only one thing. We harbor memory and theory and time and trauma and myth and becoming and story and love all simultaneously. And the, the erasures of the epistolary letters in the poems mm -hmm. really demonstrate the voices seeking to expose that tunneling of self and a way to speak of and speak through such calling experiences of trauma. And if you don't mind, um, I'm going to read page 75 and I'm actually going to, let me see if I can share it here. So this is Dear. What am I doing? I say to myself, please forgive me. I love you. Me, me, me. I'm going to work. This conjuring of voice um, of the self into love is just exquisite into self-love um, we feel led in this book led to the 
after section, which is the very last section of the renunciations, which is which encompasses a singular poem. I love that singularity of this poem because this poem, this last poem, which is the moon rose over the bay, I had a lot of feelings, feels like a beginning. That this isn't an end of a book or a journey, it's the beginning, the opening. And so if you don't mind, I'm gonna read this piece as well. Okay. The moon rose over the bay. I had a lot of feelings. The home I've been making inside myself started with a razzing, a brush clearing, the thorn and nettle, the blackberry bush falling under the bush hog. Then I rested, a cycle fallow, said winter, said the ground is too cold to break, pony, said I almost set fire to it all, lit a match, watch it ghost in the wind. Came the thaw, came the melting snowpack, the flooded river, new groundwater, the well risen. I stood in the mud field and called it pasture, stood with a needle in my mouth and called it song. Everything rushed past my small ears were in the leaves, were in the wing and the wood. About time to get a hammer, I thought. About time to get a nail and saw. I'm so in love with that piece um, for so, so many reasons. Um, but the voice leaves us in that moment of naming, call it a pasture and this godliness inside ourselves, that there's such biblical moments happening mm. in, that, in that past poem, that last mm. poem, the creation of self mm. on the precipice of building, of construction of, this idea of construction of, and it's that of that we remain lingering on. Um, and with this really, really long introduction, <laughs> <laughs> this question, Danica. <laughs> I, I, I'm curious on how you see social change manifesting mm -hmm. in your art and your mm -hmm. own creation processes, either you know specifically through the renunciations or just just in general. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you for. I you know it's like the the those um, the epistolary poems with the with the redactions. I don't look at them very often um and that one uh the uh the, that line I am gonna answer your question but I just want to say this because I was thinking about it yes um please forgive me I love you mm. um my dear friend Carlisha she's, one, she's my oldest friend um she knew me when I was like what I think I was like very small it's like 21 22 <laughs> um <laughs> And, uh, and we've been friends, we've been friends for a really long time. Uh, and I remember she and I were having a conversation. Uh, it's been probably a little bit over 10 years ago now. And that was something that she was saying to herself, like she had come, like she had come to that sort of like mantra, like through another, like through some other practice that she was engaged in. It may have been therapy. It may have been some kind of like other healing practice. I just thought, yeah, I love you. Please, like, please forgive me. I love you. Like just to the self. Yeah. You know, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. And how amazing that felt to hear from another black queer woman. Mm -hmm. um, and how I realized that I had not ever really said that to myself, like not in that way, you know? Yeah. And Again, like I think maybe this just goes back to this goes back to community and thinking about like the folks we surround ourselves with. And I, I've been really fortunate and not strategic, but I think discerning <laughs> because, <laughs> um, because I, I my friends are like these really wonderful folks who do um, who do the kinds of work 
that I aspire to do. They hold space for themselves. Um, they hold space for their art. Um, I'm thinking about one of my friends who is like, in, like, who is like listening to this conversation now, who is just like such a tremendous force and um, a tremendous talent as an artist. And um, we spend a lot of time talking about how we are practicing loving ourselves. Yeah. And I think as like black women, we are discouraged from that. There is like, I think we have to do, like, I think the expectation is that something like we can't be at the center of our own lives. And I think this is probably true for most people who are not white men, um, <laughs> that we are not encouraged <laughs> to be at the center of our own lives. There is like not a script for us to be at the center of our own lives. Yeah. And one of the places where I first encountered that notion where it was like sort of explicated for me was in the work of some of the queer second wave feminists. So Audre Lorde, um, Gloria Anzaldúa, um, and Adrian Rich, like in particular, where I was like, wait, I can just like think about this for like, they were like, I feel like their work is just like, but what if you just thought about it? <laughs> like, what if you just thought about what you were engaged in and complicit in and whether or not that served you? Yeah. And I don't know that anyone had encouraged me before reading, before I read their work to think yeah. about the scripts that I was enacting, even though like they felt wrong. Yeah. So like heterosexuality being like maybe the most obvious one um, and the easiest one to shed um, <laughs> of all the scripts. I was like, oh, great. But shedding, like sort of getting free of heterosexuality and getting free or working my way towards being free of patriarchy, those like, th that was really different. Yeah. Like my family, the structure of my family is incredibly patriarchal. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's hierarchical, um, just like in some very expected ways. Like it's, it's not, um, my family is not special in this, in this regard. Mm -hmm. Um, but it feels bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I just like, I left and I would feel bad about being like, I, I went away to grad school and then away to a different grad school. And I think my family was waiting for me to come home. Yeah. And the longer I was away, the less home was home because I didn't want to slip back into those practices and into those scripts. And, and I needed some help to think about what I could do differently or how to do it differently. And I, I really do in my thinking credit, Anzal Dua, Rich, <laughs> Lord, um, for their clarity and just like the, the ways that they model in the writing and in their lives resistance to 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 those models to to patriarchy um and and the work of the renunciations is i think <laughs> i don't know that i've ever really articulated it this way but it is like a, a refusal of like the father right yeah. to say like this oh. is the, the father is at the center but what if instead of him being a god he's a man and if he's a man well then that's easy to <laughs> so like <laughs> bring him here and then we can just put him over here <laughs> get him out of the way and I had actually like in my practice in my life like that had happened yeah, yeah. like my my dad was not at the center of my life even though he very much wanted to be um and but we just like we stopped talking to each other in 2008 yeah and it was amazing I think he he stopped talking to me and I was like, oh, bet we're not talking to each other. And I just never talked to him again. <laughs> like, <laughs> and so, and that actually gave me room to start thinking about like how I wanted to relate to people, but I was still carrying around a lot of bad ideas. Yeah. Um, but I could see myself, I, I could see myself, I do see myself working through those bad ideas about like putting like the beloved on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like, not being like alongside, but sort of like positioning myself below. Yeah. I could see that as like a direct, there was like a, there's just like a, a through line from like my family to like those relationships. And I could see myself in bestiary, like trying to figure out how not to do that. Yeah. But I had to like, not be a person. <laughs> like, I was like, let me try. I was like, I'll be a centaur. I'll be a chimera. <laughs> I'll be like any number of other things that are not like, that aren't like a person because I don't know how to get to this in another way. Right. And by the time I start writing the poems for the renunciation, a lot of those practices were a lot clearer what I wanted to do. So to be alongside. And that to me feels like such a big shift in understanding my relationship to other people 
but also like my place in the world, yeah. right? Alongside other animals, alongside plants, just alongside everything. It's just like, I'm alongside. I do not have dominion over anything. Yes. You know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that comes through in the art, but I also think there have been some really momentous shifts in thinking that are more mainstream now than they, than they had been. I think the fact that I can say, oh yeah, we got married. And then, you know, people are like, yay. And not like, you know, the people I know are like, oh, you're going to burn in hell for the rest of time. Oh, um, it's like, there's more, there's more acceptance, even though there are ways that obviously the state, I think yeah. very vigorously, particularly against trans kids right now. Yeah. And like trans girls are like, the state is like trying to stamp out. Yeah those like that the fullness of people's lives and I think I think they know that they can't really the state and states are like they can't really do it to like grown gay people yeah. right they can't do it to women in the same way although I do think the state is trying <laughs> oh yeah they're trying right they're trying right now but I think so many things are it's it, it feels like last grasps it does. You know, it, it, it feels, feels like, like desperate. Like white supremacy and the patriarchy is doing this like, ah, like because um, things have changed so substantially, have, right? I think like in people's minds and in people's hearts. And also I think like in enough states where like those laws aren't gonna, you know, like people can move to other, I mean, like that's, I, that's not, I know that's not easy having moved a lot, right. but there are other places in this big place that we live in where there's more room for people to just be themselves, you know, and, and to, to be able to have a fuller life. I think the, the, the challenge is that that often means leaving whatever place has been home. Yes. Um, and not having a home to go back to, I think is one of the things that I like struggle a lot with. Um, and I think my family would absolutely like come back. And I'm like, I don't want to go over there. I was like, y'all are a mess. Um, so I don't know that this necessarily answers your, your question, but I do think like that the, the shape of my life via select, like my community, but I think also just like some of the larger conversations that are happening have made it possible for me to write the kinds of poems that I'm writing and thinking about. Like we talk more about like mental health. We talk yeah. more about suicide. We talk more about being on medication. It's just like, there's still stigma in a lot of places, but that stigma to me feels like a lot more mediated or modulated than the sort of flat. So it's like, I don't know. I think I can do, I feel like some of the, one of the things that my poems can do for other folks. And I, this is like a hard thing to like try to imagine, but when I tried to think about like the work that I thought the book might do, yeah. I thought one of those tracks was if someone read it and had experienced feeling suicidal or attempting suicide, that they would know they weren't alone in that. Yeah. Like that that's a thing. Like it's like a, that's a part of being human sometimes, you know, or like being depressed or being lonely or being scared or being small or being harmed. Um, but that there, there could be something on the other side. I think, I think the renunciations and your art does for the readers who pick it up and especially, you know, the growing and evolving readers who pick it up, the, the, the newly emerging artists, the artist who is coming to terms with their artistry and their identities would pick up your work and just like Enzel Dua and Lord, you know, put their, put their work as hands on our shoulders and gave us permission, I think mm -hmm. your work does a very similar thing. It, it becomes a model on how to, to speak of the difficulty in order to move through it, in order to um, not be defined by it. Mm -hmm. And that is overwhelmingly powerful. You know, and, and in my opinion, like I see that in your work. And part of the reason why I was just thrilled that you said yes to come <laughs> to talk with me. <laughs> and I appreciate, there's so much that, I mean, there's so many tangents I could just take of all the things that you just said and how generous and meaningful they are, not only I think to me, but also to those who are watching or who will watch this conversation. Um, 
And I just want to thank you for that and thinking of all sort of the ways that your art is, is potentially moving because I think to write, to create, we don't want to be doing that in any type of bubble or in any mm -hmm. type of aloneness. Mm -hmm. There is community in what we do and in what mm -hmm. we create. Yeah. I was thinking as you were talking too about the, there's this uh, chat book by Jennifer Espinoza. Um, mm. It's called Outside the Body. There's something like hope. And it was like a limited edition chat book. It's yeah. kind of hard to get. Um, but there are these poems in which she writes, you know, about being a trans woman and about loving herself mm. and how that wasn't possible or like that that's something that she's practicing. And I remember reading that and thinking like, I'm practicing too. You know, as I was like, yeah, like we're just like trying to figure out how to love ourselves because this world is like, don't love yourself. Yeah. But just like the directness of her language, you know, it's like, there isn't a lot of artifice around it. She's like, this is the mission. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the world is trying to kill me. How do I hold space for myself? Exactly. And that's a different, like, that's a different challenge in its granularity than the challenge that I experience. But it's a, but the the world is trying to harm me, and the world is telling me I don't matter, yeah. or that my suffering doesn't matter, my joy doesn't matter, mm -hmm. the, the 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 quotidian aspects of my life don't matter. I'm like, well, all of that matters, like so much to me, you know. Well, and 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 not just to you. It actually it matters to the futurity of society, like us as a collective, as a species. Mm -hmm. Like if we can't figure out ways to embrace humanity in all mm -hmm. its beautiful difference. Mm -hmm. We are going to just burn ourselves to the ground. And the reality for me is that as women of color, and especially like for you as a, as a queer woman of color, like loving yourself is the way forward. Like loving yourself is a modeling for us to understand all of us that when we love ourselves we can then show love more more in a, in a grand scale it's kind mm -hmm. of like you know they got it right on the airplanes you got to put your own oxygen mask on first the therapists love the therapists love that one too i know I don't tell you, they love it every, I, every <laughs> almost every therapist i've had has been like I put your oxygen mask on first i was like every every single one of y'all go say it but it's like it's so true but I think about what it what happens for me as a writer and also as a reader when I'm reading work where the poet is working through like working through and toward the love of self. Yeah. Um, like how I that makes also makes me feel less alone. You know, yeah. like I'm like, right, yeah, I'm like I'm trying to figure out how to do that too. And so like uh Jennifer's work um was uh something I was reading while I was working on the poems for renunciation, for the renunciations, um, alongside all the folks who I read so often, you know, um, who do that work for me, like Sharon Olds does that work for me, Marie Howe does that work for me, Lucille Clifton, Gwendolyn Brooks, Natasha Trethaway, Carl Phillips, who spent so much time thinking in the poems, like just big, yeah. it's like we're in the thoughts, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, and it's like, and I love just sort of wander, getting to wander around and like in that space and, you know, just like folks who are like, I'm going to hold space for whatever I'm interested in. Yeah. I'm going to hold space for myself and my thoughts and my loves mm -hmm. and my hurts. Yeah. And I think that that, I don't know, like th those writers have really just like opened up like such, I feel like there's, I'm not having to build something. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm adding like something on the wall, <laughs> but like, the, <laughs> like it's already there, you know? And and it feels, it feels, I wonder about like if people have this, but like writing in a tradition feels mm. so good. Yeah. Um, it's just like, it feels, uh, it feels really great to like, think about like, who are the folks who came before me? Who am I writing alongside? And then to think about like, who's gonna, who's coming next, you know, like, what who are those? I, who is, who am I in conversation with mm -hmm. across time and space? Mm -hmm. and, form does that I, I I also mm. think you know just this this echoing of um even expressions you know of of 
picking up a conversation where one of our ancestors or our our literary ancestors um, paved the way for us mm -hmm. is, is really exciting. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open it up for to see if the audience has a couple questions before we wrap up. But this one's my favorite. Um, what do you find is hopeful <clears throat> in poetry as an art form? What makes you hopeful in poetry as an art form, if anything? <laughs> There's so many things. Um... So as we know, like Twitter is a kind of hellscape, um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's also this really wonderful place for poems. So like, this is one of the things I think social media is really great for, where I encounter lots of poets who I never would have encountered before, both Thanks. because they're promoting their own work, but also the work people share, yeah. where I'm like, I've never, I was like, I've never come across this. Um, and so it's just like, there's so many good poems. I do so many different kinds of things. It makes me so happy. I guess maybe that's the word, like just like thinking about it. And even when people share, I don't know, like if you're on Twitter, folks who are listening are on Twitter or watching are on Twitter, but there occasionally there will be like a poem from like a six-year-old or a poem from a 10-year-old that'll just like start circulating like every so often. Um, or just like seeing like what little kids are doing. It's just, it feels sometimes like my Twitter feed anyway, feels like a sort of democratized space for poetry. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe one of the things that I love is that there are so many venues that are open and encouraging to poets um, who are emerging. You know, there are so many spaces for poets to, poets and writers, but I think the, I think the poets are really good at this. Mm -hmm. I mean like, oh, we need a space for Black poets. We need a space for Latinx poets. We need a space for Asian American poets because like this world is kind of wild and yep. it's kind of nice to get in with some folks who may have some similar interests. And what I learned at Kaveh Kanem, I was really worried. I was a fool before I went to Kaveh Kanem because <laughs> I had a really, and this has to do in part because of um, the university I went to was a very small state school and they didn't teach a lot of poetry. Mm, yeah. um, and, I, and so as a result, not because someone taught this to me, but because I didn't have access to it, mm. I thought Black poetry was really narrow. Mm. And then I went to Kaveh Kam and I was like, oh, I could do anything I want and it'll be Black. That's great. Yeah. And then it just like, I, and then I just like was relieved. So I think that there are all of these, like there's like uh, Lambda, Vona, like there are all these spaces that where folks can get together with not yeah. necessarily like-minded folks, but maybe maybe similarly lived. Santa Maria yeah. for me was, it was the same. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I would mm -hmm. say that I felt very similar that I felt like I, I, I was foolish before um, Santa Mundo. And then I fell into the community that I had longed for, mm -hmm. um, that I was a part of, but felt like so um, detached from. And mm. there's something empowering about having that community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because it's like, oh, this, is, this isn't little. I thought it was little, mm. but as it turns out, it's big. And I think like, there is also this other thing where it's like, I feel like, I'm lear like I've learned more expansive definitions of community yes. too, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I, it just, it makes me feel hopeful. Like it really does. Um, and I'm, I'm not good at having hope. <laughs> it's like, it's not, that's like a new practice. Um, yeah. uh, but I think in poetry, in writing, like I can get so excited. Um, like I'm teaching Carl Phillips seventh book. So like out of like 45, like his seventh book. And then I'm, <laughs> and I'm teaching like, so it's the rest of love. And then I'm teaching, um, Diane Seuss's Frank Sonnet. Yeah. And there are just like poems in both of those books where I'm just like, oh, and I'm like making Melissa listen. I'm like, listen to this poem that someone we kind of know now, but didn't know at the time, like wrote, you know? Um, and it just, it feels good. It feels good. Well, and, maybe, and maybe I should reword that, eventually reword that question to what inspires you, because I agree with the hope, like, especially in the context of like, um, you know, human justice and environmental justice, you know, that idea of hope is, is too, is too passive at times. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're, if you're 
kitchen was on fire, would you sit on your couch and look over your shoulder and be like, oh, I I hope that my fire goes out. Or would you get your ass up and get a fire extinguisher and put that thing out? Like Mm -hmm. you'd stay in your house. Mm -hmm. And yet I, so for me, I feel like we, in a way, um, there was a, there was an essay out back at like early, uh, maybe 2005, that was about like having to um, earn back hope and I think we have, we have to earn it back a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the inspiration, what you've said is in very inspiring of the places where, where poetry can be held, where poetry and the artists can be acknowledged and, and seen and, you know, bring our full selves in, into mm-hmm. the mix. And that, that's really, really exciting. Um, I'm going to open up the next, the last 10 minutes to see if there are any questions for you all in the audience. Thank you so much for being here and, and, and listening to, I am just amazed by your comments, Tanika. <laughs> like part of me loves this because the transcripts are really what I'm, I'm out for <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> to, to go back and look through them. Oh, it looks like we do have, um, a question by Mary Alice. Let's mm-hmm. see. It says, I'm starting um, down the barrel of my first workshop experience. Um, oh, is it Mars? Oh, thanks, Mars. I'm, I'm starting down the barrel of my first workshop experience as an undergrad. I'm not a poet, but I've been writing very personal prose with work that feels very close, especially to your personal identity. What is your advice about receiving constructive criticism and applying it to your work? Thank you, Mars. Thank you, Mars. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, this question brings to mind the uh, practice of discernment. Um, and so with very personal work that I felt like that felt fresh and tender, I likely would not bring that to a general workshop. Um, I might try to scope out in that workshop folks who have like comments that are really thoughtful. I might, you know, try to like see if I could suss out whether or not my instructor was somebody who was like, you know, thoughtful and like I could bring something that was a little bit scary to. Um, But I might not bring it to the whole group um, because sometimes the whole group, they, they start doing stuff and it's not malicious necessarily, but I think it can be especially in the undergrad space, like folks are still learning what they understand to be good. Folks are still learning how to talk about work. And if we're bringing in like that work that we are feeling like sort of tender about, that can estrange us from our own work. Um, And so I would probably think about work that was like adjacent or work that I felt like, oh, this is funny or the stakes feel a little bit lower, but I'm looking maybe like I'm trying out some similar techniques in that work. So on the craft level, not on the content level. (laughs) So like having sort of like a, having a, a a, a sort of craft doppelganger (laughs) that like, um, because like some of that feedback, if people are like, oh, I wasn't necessarily able to, like, I was a little bit confused in the syntax and the sentences here. If they're saying that about something that you feel not uninvested in, but somewhat less invested in, or not uh, as emotionally invested in, uh, that then you can take that over to the work that you feel more tender about and be like, oh, are my sentences clear? Is my syntax getting in the way? Um, is it is my syntax doing the work that I want it to do? So that's that actually is my advice is like if it, if you feel really uh, tender about something, I would say uh, maybe keep it out of the big workshop. <laughs> I don't know. The big workshop is, is a, is a challenging, is a challenging space. Is that your experience, Felicia, as well? Well, I, you know, I structure my workshops in a way that is everything that I didn't have. Um, mm-hmm. so it's the artists talking about their own work, it's celebrations and it's opportunities. Like I don't even mm-hmm. use the word critique because I yeah. don't like yeah. that word. Um, and I, I tell everyone in workshop that this is a time for, for people to pay attention to your art and to have a conversation with you about it. Like that's, a, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't, I, I don't think it alleviates the anxiety as much as it, 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 it could, but I think I'm working at least in, in, in my spaces to create safe, welcoming 
Mm -hmm. um, supportive because that's really where the secret sauce is. Mm -hmm. When artists feel supported, they will take mm -hmm. risks. Mm -hmm. Period. That's my, that's also how I'm trying. That's how I run my workshops as well. Um, so if you, like, I think if you have a workshop like that, it might be a little bit safer, but even then, yeah, even sometimes then you gotta think you gotta test it out. Just be like, what are, what are these people in this room going to do? Because from workshop to workshop, it's also different, Yeah, but I think that's like opportunities, celebrations, like. I just do like what's working and what's a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we have a, we have a couple more yeah. questions. Okay. Okay. We have Emma. How do you deal with vulnerability of sharing work that is personal to you, and how do you personally cal um, calm those nerves and anxieties? Uh, this is a really good question, and uh, I share work that feels to me like it has moved into the space of art. So it's not just the feeling, but I've done something with the feeling that is interesting to me. Uh, and so then I can get excited about the parts that are interesting. <laughs> and, and that actually helps sort of mitigate some of the nerves, um, but I don't read things. So like, there's a there's a whole section in my, in my book, both books actually, like I don't, so like in Bestiary, the poem, How to Be Alone, I never read it. Um, and then the section now, then in the renunciations, I read the, I occasionally read the first poem from that section and I don't read anything else. I really like the poems in that section. I, they're doing like, they're doing a lot of the things that I love poems to do. Um, but it's just too hard. So I just like, I don't read them, but I think they're good. <laughs> and so for me, it's like that balance and, uh, and I have poems that like maybe aren't, they aren't as pleasurable to me as poems. So I tend, I don't share those like publicly. Like those are, like those poems are doing different and, and other important, other, other important work. Um, so if I get nervous or anxious, um, as I did before the renunciations came out, you know, I just like did a lot of work to take care of myself. I talked to my therapist. I worked with someone about like who, um, helps writers sort of think about how to sort of frame or set boundaries in interviews around like sensitive topics. Mm -hmm. um, I talked with my editor. So I just like communicated with folks and mm -hmm. that was, that was really helpful. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, let's see, we have two more questions. Maybe we'll squeeze both in. Uh, this one's from Chase. As an educator who works with undergrads and enjoys their company, why do you think it's important for these students um, regardless of their affiliation with the arts to come to events like this and hear artists like yourself? Well, I don't know, Chase. <laughs> 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 I mean, I think it's important to, I, I think it's important to, to hear how people think about making art. There are like so many different approaches to that. Um, and so I, I'm interested in, uh, in, in how folks are, are thinking through that. And as a person who is nosy, I kind of like hearing about like people's like thought processes and their business. So I don't know if those are your interests, but those we are absolutely wonder. Fine. We call it wonder. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, I, I, I really do think that many of us as artists, or at least poets, we, you know, we started off like, oh, I was so snoopy. I was snoopy rummaging through shit when I was a kid, when I wasn't supposed to, like my own little archaeologist mm -hmm. of, of, of my house. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your question, Chase. And we'll do this one last one by Rhea. What, it, what is poetry to you and how would you define it? Rhea, now come on. Uh, <laughs> Araya, come on. I don't know which one, it, but come on. Uh, this is a great, that's a great question. Um, I don't really have an answer to it. Poetry to me, I guess is um, concentrated investigation. I like that they're little and that there's, I like, I, I get to make connections and leaps with the writer where maybe the writer won't maybe the writer didn't mean for me to leap in that way, but there's still just enough to like keep me hanging in there. Um, how would I define poetry? I don't have a definition. That's so weird. I don't have one. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like it's like, I know it when I see it. <laughs> I, I, love that the, I like, I like that they're little, like I love, I, I love, love that they're little. That's one of my favorite things. Like, so Melissa, my wife writes, very long essays. Just is that Melissa in the background too? 
Yeah, and just making all kinds of noise. So like, <laughs> she just came in. Um, but she's just like, she, she wrote like a 10,000, often is writing like a 10,000 word essay. Mm-hmm. All of the renunciations, including the front matter, the title pages, the acknowledgements at the end, all of it is like 9,000 words. So Melissa, one essay, 10,000 words, as long as my whole book. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's wild. I, I don't know what that means, but I think there's something interesting about it. So I, I do like the smallness and trying to like look at a at in the lyric mode, in lyric poetry, looking at, at a small part of a feeling. And yeah. then when I'm and then like putting a book together, sort of trying to think about how those small parts all fit together or could fit together. But yeah, no, I don't have a definition. <laughs> And I feel called out. I feel like I'm supposed to have one because I teach, but I don't. I'm just like, we all know what it is. Look over yeah. there. <laughs> what do you think, Rhea? Mm-hmm. And Rhea, Rhea is a student of mine and my class as an artist. So thank you. That's a good question. Um, you know, I always think of it as like the exquisite sparseness of a world in a microcosm. Mm-hmm. And and that's not really a definition. It's just the way I like to believe when I'm world building in, in yeah. the space. Because I'm like you, I wrote my, my first essay that ever got published it was a lyric essay and I worked on it for five months. When they published it, that damn thing was a page and a half long. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. It's just, it's devastating. So I'm like, if I, it's just, it's gonna be little. I just, I like, if I can like, I really like, little 14 lines, little, little sonnet, little sonnet box. I really like that. I'm like, let's just make it little. Um, what you do in that sonnet is extraordinary, yeah. right? Like yeah. those lines, like every mm-hmm. word counts. Mm-hmm. Um, Danika, this has been just f- fabulous and fantastic. And I want to thank yeah. everyone who has joined us tonight and those who will watch this video yet to come. Thank you for sharing space with us. Um, you may find discussions, pre recorded discussions with Jennifer S. Chang and Dr. Joshua Bennett on the Conversations website, as well as the future recordings of Wa Win and Vanessa and Helica Villarreal will be going up soon. Um, virtual events that will be open to the public again are the Elliston Poet in Residence for 2022, which is Hyde E. Erdrich. Um, and, De- and Dr. Craig Santos Perez will be joining the conversation. And Dr. Danica De- Kelly's work, our conversation will be up for about six months. Um, and so you'll be able to take a look at it as well off of our website. So we continue to explore the, the art form of poetry as a catalyst for social change and what that might mean. Thank you for watching and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you so much. And thank you, Felicia. This was so fun. Oh, I know this yeah. is fun. This one, you know, and here I, here I started our original conversation with a bit of a downer um, before I started recording. And then this it, just, this just lifted my spirit so much. So thank you so much. <laughs> a pleasure, a pleasure. Okay, so take care. Thank y'all. Bye everybody.